Okay, well, thank you very much. Especially thank you uh, to the PyData team for having me here. So can you hear me all right? Yeah? No? There's like... It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm Robert, and I work as a data scientist for uh, Flixbus. Uh, and usually what I do there is uh, optimization and machine learning. Uh, and in my spare time, sometimes I do similar stuff, but with uh, slightly different data. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today, some slightly different data. Uh, what I analyzed is uh, user comments, so comments that were placed by some people uh, at uh, some articles they may or may have not read uh, online for uh, different news outlets. And uh, basically, the question that I'm trying to tackle here is, uh, what can we learn from user comments on news sites? I guess most people would say not much, if any. I mean, have you read them? Um, but I'm trying to tackle this question, uh, not if we can draw some facts or wisdom out of these, but more from a data science perspective. So uh, can we uncover some, some structures uh, or some patterns in the data? Um, so I first briefly uh, will talk about the way I actually scraped the data, so where I got it from and how much actually it is. And then the main part of this talk will be about uh, DoctorVac, uh, so like this uh, neural, net neural network method for uh, word embeddings. And of course, I'll actually start with uh, word to vac which is the basis uh, for DoctorVac. And in the very end, we'll briefly uh, also touch uh, some supervised machine learning uh, actually on the output or on the uh, document embeddings of the DoctorVac network. OK. so. Um, these are uh, the three news sites where I gathered the data from, so Die Zeit, Spiegel Online, and Focus. Uh, so there's an international audience here, but I guess there's some people from Germany as well. So who's familiar with that, with these news sites? Some, some? Oh, it's actually, okay, that's, that's plenty. Uh, that's good, because actually when I looked at the data, I had some working hypothesis in mind, which kind of looks like this. So, because I mean, there's <laughs> undoubtedly, <laughs> Undoubtedly, there's, it's, there's, a, there's a gradient in, in quality uh, in, in the articles themselves, so I thought there might actually also be a gradient uh, in, the, in the user comments. Uh, so like some slightly smarter comments made on site online uh, and like all the hatred and racism piling up at focus. So, uh, so we'll later on uh, take a look at whether we find some evidence uh, for this hypothesis uh, in the data, uh, but you have to bear with me until uh, the very end of my talk. Um, OK, let's first talk about how I gathered the data. So this is a screenshot of uh, like the comment section of uh, Die Zeit. And uh, it lo basically looks like this, so people can put their comments there. Um, what is nice about that, though, is if you look into the HTML source code, uh, then actually the comments pop out in the source code, uh, which is super nice, because then you can use something like the request library or LXML to basically just parse uh, the HTML source code, and then you can gather uh, and get the comments uh, just right out of the source code. And I did this. Um, so uh, I gathered quite uh, a lot of user comments, so about 280,000 from Spiegel Online, 170,000 from Zeit, and uh, roughly 50,000 from Focus. And uh, they were uh, written for articles between January 2014 uh, and, and June 2016, so roughly uh, a year ago. OK, um, so of course I did some very, very brief pre-processing of the data. For this, I used the uh, Natural Language Toolkit. Um, and I didn't do much for pre-processing. So uh, these are three actual comments, um, uh, how, they, how they look like in the raw data. Um, so for instance, uh, and as I said, it's a it's German news site. So of course, the comments will be in German. But I tried to translate them uh, as good as possible. Um, uh, so for instance, here is, uh, I'm just going to read the top one from Focus, which basically says something, 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 teach unity and justice and freedom for our German fatherland at our schools. Um, so I took these comments, uh, and the only preprocessing I did was basically lower casing them and removing punctuation. That's it. So no stemming or whatever, just putting them basically in Python lists. Um, and for now, uh, let's forget where these comments actually come from. So in the first processing steps, I don't care that the first comment was actually uh, placed on a news article by Focus. Uh, let's just label them with some uh, individual labels. So let's say this is the first document, that's the second document, and the other one is the third document, and so on. So that every document has a label, but for now we don't care from which news site uh, the user comment actually stems from. OK, so then I had this data, and I thought, OK, um, I want to do some cool stuff with this. Uh, I'm just going to throw it uh, into uh, a DocTovec network. 
um, uh, which is some super cool deep learning library uh, for uh, word embeddings and text processing, and then some amazing stuff pops out at the other end. <laughs> and actually, what turns out, uh, I got two things uh, wrong with this. So the first thing is that is actually not deep learning. It says so on the Jensen page, so the library I use. It says deep learning, but there's nothing deep about it. It's just three layers, right? It does, there's an input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. So it's, it's more like a normal uh, artificial neural network. And the other thing I got wrong is the amazing stuff doesn't pop out at the end. It actually squeezes out at the side. Um, never mind. Still, there's amazing stuff happening. Um, <coughs> how that actually works, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's assume that we already have this amazing stuff. So what is this amazing stuff? Um, this amazing stuff, uh, for now, let's focus also on word to vac So it, because doc to vac gives us basically word embeddings and document embeddings, let's first uh, but just focus on word to vac so the basis of doc to vac So what is the amazing stuff that we get here? Um, so what we'll, uh, this will give us some so-called word embeddings. So basically, this is vector representations of words. So for instance, let's say we have a trained network on a like, decent corpus like Wikipedia. Um, then we would, for instance, gather something like this. So we would get an n-dimensional data. So here I just chose four. And since four is pretty bad to draw, I draw it just in two dimensions. Um, so we have this vector representation for a word, let's say hamburger. Um, and then this is some vector in the space. Uh, but then the nice thing is we can do some operations on it. So first of all, we can actually compare it to other vectors. Uh, so we would, for instance, figure out that this is the representation of the word cheeseburger, uh, which is very similar to the word hamburger. So they encode some sort of meaning. Uh, and these two are quite similar, but uh, they might be very different to, and this is now very subtle, uh, very different to the word Flixbus. Um, so this is something nice uh, about these uh, vector representations, so we can actually compute similarities uh, among words. And for those who are actually interested in math, though, basically what you usually do is this uh, cosine similarity, uh, which basically is dot product uh, divided by the product of the norms of the vectors. OK. Uh, but that's not the only thing you can do with this. Uh, actually, you can also do mathematical operations. And uh, probably you've seen this example a lot, a lot, because everyone uses that. So I, I have to, too. Um, so actually, you can add and subtract these vectors. So for instance, we could uh, use the vector representation for the word king, subtract the word man, add the word woman, and what we get is the actual vector representation for the word queen. This is super nice. I mean, like this is amazing stuff that pops out uh, of these networks. OK, so uh, let's quickly uh, look at it, uh, how it actually works. Um, so basically, what a word to vac network does is learning or to predict words from given contexts, right? Give me a context of words, and I predict you what is the most likely word that occurs in this context. And um, for now, uh, oops, uh, let's, let's look at the, uh, the network. So basically, um, for now, let's say the context is very simple, and the only thing we use as a context is basically a, pre uh, a precessing word. So what is the first word? Uh, given the first word, what's going to be the second word? So this is basically what we're going to train the network on. So this is how the simple version of a word to vac network looks like. Um, so if you look at the input layer, um, this is usually fairly big, right? Because the input layer has one neuron for each and every unique word that you have in your data set, in your corpus. So for instance, the, the little fella uh, at the very top with x1 might encode the word unity. Um, its neighboring neuron might encode the word justice. And the next one, freedom, and so on and so forth, like this middle feller end. So we have an input neuron for each and every unique word in our data set. And if you look at the output layer uh, here on the right hand side, it's uh, the very same encoding. So basically, uh, the same words that appear on the input layer also appear on the output layer. So the first neuron might encode the word unity, the second one, the, the word justice, and so on and so forth. OK, so what we now train the network on is making predictions. Uh, so what is the most likely word giving a particular context? And as I said, as context, let's say the only thing we care about, the first word. Um, so if we would train this network, it would work kind of like this. So we had this word pair, Einigkeit and und, so basically unity and and. And what we train the network on is uh, we would use unity as an input. And uh, because every, every one of these fellas encodes for uh, one particular word in our corpus, the input vector is basically just a single one for this x1, this little fella that uh, encodes unity, and zero for the rest. So we would put that into the network, then propagate it through the network, through the hidden layer, up to the output layer. Uh, then some, some mathematical gibberish happens in between. 
and uh, we get out some output vector. And if this is our first uh, pair of training data, so the, the first pair of words that we have, uh, unity and, um, then basically what we would get is just random gibberish. But what we can do now is actually compare this random gibberish uh, to the actual target value that we try to predict. Because uh, we can compare now this output with the actual target vector. And because we're training on pairs, uh, the target was actually the word and, right? So the target is, as you can see here on the right-hand side, just a bunch of zeros and a single one for this output neuron that encodes the word and. And now we can uh, compare these two, value, uh, these two vectors, uh, compute some error measure, and then propagate uh, the error back to the network and adjust these weight matrices, which are part of the intricate mathematical operations that happen in the middle, uh, such that the output vector uh, resembles more uh, the target vector. And we could do this uh, back and forth, back and forth, now with our entire training data. So the next uh, pair we would train on would be the word and, uh, and the target would be justice. And we would basically do a couple of sweeps through our entire training set, so all the uh, um, uh, all the documents or all the user comments that we have and train the network. We would always adjust the weights in order to make the target vector uh, and the output, make the, uh, output vector more look alike. So after training the network, uh, what do we get? OK, so let's say uh, we now uh, did several sweeps through our training data and we have a trained network. And if we now put in, uh, again, the word n, for example, we chuck it in here. So these are now the actual mathematical operations. So we have. Uh, like this linear operation where we multiply the input vector uh, with this weight matrix, and then there's another linear operation, and on top of that, there's a nonlinear operation uh, called softmax. But what it, there's nitty gritty details, but what it actually gives us is the probability of uh, another word given the first word. So here it would uh, tell us, okay, what is the probability, for instance, for the word justice given the word and, right? So it's like 10% here after training. Uh, freedom is also 10%, hand is less likely, so it's 5%, um, and, and that's that, right? So this is, uh, now we have a trained network. Um, thing is, so where's the word embeddings now? So if you remember, I told you that the actual amazing stuff doesn't come out at the back, where we get these uh, probability descriptions, but actually it squeezes out that side. So if we look at this weight matrix, this is actually uh, where uh, the word embeddings can be found. So this weight matrix has as many rows as we have unique words. And this means for each and every word, uh, like x1 to uh, xv, we have the corresponding word vector now uh, in, uh, in this matrix. So we could just, for instance, look up the kth row, which would be the word vector for the word end, and we would get uh, our vector representation. And I mean, in the examples I used before, that was four dimensions, but usually you choose something between 100 and 300, which is also the number of hidden nodes in your network. OK. Um, so this was like words of in a nutshell. Uh, and a very simple version. The actual thing is slightly different, or slightly more complex, but it's actually uh, pretty much doing the same thing. Uh, because so far, our context was just like the preceding word, uh, what's the probability of the following word. What you actually do is uh, you train on a more broader context. So for instance, what we actually want to do, for instance, is something like, uh, I want to predict the word and given the context of and, justice, freedom, and four. But it's basically the same thing. So uh, we just put the context uh, at one end of the network and we get try to predict uh, the middle word, so to say, on the other end. And still, the, the same thing holds, so we can look up the word vectors uh, in these matrices. OK, so this was word to vac. Uh, now let's make. Uh, another step and look at Dr. Vec. And actually, the step from Word to Vec to Dr. Vec is, is rather small. Um, so, so now we have word embeddings, so we have vector representation for words. What we are after is actually uh, vector representation for entire documents. And these can be arbitrary complex. So, in our case, this is user comments, uh, but it, it's not limited to that. So, it could be, for instance, entire books. So, we could have, uh, for example, I don't know, like a trained network on. Uh, uh, like literature, and then we would, for instance, figure out that, for example, Alice in Wonderland, the book, is pretty similar to uh, Through the Looking Glass, uh, but which is way different to the vector representation of Das Kapital by Karl Marx. So, um, so how do we now make the step from word to vac uh, to doc to vac? As I said, the step is actually pretty tiny. So it's 
almost the same network as before. So we're going to train the network on, uh, let's have a given context. Please predict the word in the middle. And the only thing we now add is we have the context plus the document tag, right? So we have the context and the document tag on the left-hand side as the input and just the prediction of a word as an output. So, so because this, this was the very first user comment, um, which had the doc, document label doc1, uh, this is basically the input then. So we want to predict the word and, given the word justice and freedom, and given the document tag number one. And the beauty here is then, of course, there's again a weight matrix. Uh, we can look up the kth element in this matrix to get the vector embeddings uh, for a particular document, the kth document. And, and that's the nice thing, so we have now these document embeddings, but also we have the word embeddings for free, so we get them too. So basically this gives us two things at the same time, uh, document and word embeddings. Okay, so this was like a very brief and quick overview of how DocTavec works. Uh, now let's actually look at uh, what comes out if I use the user comments that I scraped on these online news sources, uh, and if I train a DocTavec network. Uh, of course, for, for that, I use the, the amazing uh, Jensen library, it's super nice, uh, where they have a, a pretty, uh, pretty nice implementation for Python. And uh, so I, I used all the user comments, uh, chucked them through the network, a couple of epochs. It ran for uh, a couple of hours. Um, and then I had my document and word embeddings. So let's first look at the results. Uh, first, let's look at the actual word embeddings we get out. Uh, so I first checked if, if my network actually picked up something meaningful or if uh, the whole computation time was just basically uh, uh, just producing garbage. Um, so the first thing I looked at, okay, so uh, now we can uh, ask, of course, the network for the uh, word embeddings, and we can ask the network, what do you think is the most similar word, for instance, to the word car, right? So we look up the, uh, the word embedding that is the closest to the word vector of car, and the network responds, okay, so what I think is the most similar to car is actually automobile. That's very nice, so this makes sense. So car, automobile, it's very related. And here in brackets, you see the, the actual cosine similarity, which uh, ranges from minus one to one, uh, where one is like perfect alignment or, or perfect similarity. Okay, so car, automobile, that makes sense. Um, but again, we're looking here at user comments, so let's uh, ask a little bit more nasty questions, right? So, dear beloved Dr. Vac, what is the most similar to fake news, right? And so in German, actually, fake news is a single word, Lügenpresse, so that's why it works here. <coughs> and uh, this is what it spits out. So it thinks the most similar word to fake news is actually Gutmensch. Right, so I, I translate it as this do-gooder. So it's this diminishing term uh, for people who actually think it would be very nice if we are kind to each other instead of assholes. Um, so it's uh, super nice, and of course you can also look at more uh, results. Uh, so a close second is uh, Putin versteher. <laughs> so which I translate as it's, uh, Putin's uh, disciple, right? And on third place, it's conspiracy theory. Okay, um, we can look at more. Uh, so. It, because as I said, the only pre-processing I did was lower casing everything and just removing punctuation. So basically, uh, abbreviations are basically words to that thing. So NPD, uh, that's a German, hor a horrible German party that's like the new Nazi party. Uh, so but we can still ask the network, uh, what do you think is uh, the closest matching word to NPD? And it's CDU. <laughs> so that's a, that's a German uh, Christian uh, Democratic Party. Uh, close second is actually the CSU, <laughs> which is the Bavarian part. And, and that, this is a bit odd, but I mean, this is numerics, and maybe actually it's true. Uh, uh, third place is the FIFA. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, so that was so far regarding similarities. Uh, as I said, what you, the, the most amazing stuff you can do is actually doing mathematical operations like uh, addition and subtraction of, of vectors. So, um, for instance, what do you think is Brexit minus England plus Greece? So if you now thought Brexit, I unfortunately have to disappoint you. The actual, the closest one is haircut. <laughs> However, Brexit is the second closest one, okay? The, but still very nice. Brexit minus England plus Greece is almost Brexit. Okay, so let's get uh, nasty again. So what do you think is that? It's Erdogan. So Hitler plus Putin is Erdogan. 
<laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> let's let's do one one final one because I mean, as I said, this is like the example everyone uses if you have a decent data set. So what do you think is king minus man plus woman, right? In a decent data set, that's queen, no questions asked. But again, we're talking about uh, user comments. And it's Angela. <laughs> so she's, a, she's the queen of Germany. I'm not making this up. This actually came out of this network. OK, so let's move on and spend the rest of the time now doing machine learning, because so far we only lo looked at the, uh, um, the word embeddings that spun out of this network. Um, now let's look back at our initial hypothesis and say, uh, OK, give, give me a random comment. Um, I want to tell you from which news site it originated, right? Um, so basically, this is uh, the pipeline here. So I start with the uh, raw, slightly preprocessed comment. I chuck it into Doctovec. Uh, I get the document uh, vector out of it. Then I take the document vector, put it into a machine learning classifier, and the machine learning classifier is supposed to tell me where uh, the comment uh, actually originated from, so where, where it was made. So is that actually a sensible? Th does that task make sense? Right? It could be super, super hard. And the truth is, it is a very hard task, because, uh, because most of the comments are just one-liners, so something like this. So it's clear that these things would come as a comment. So it, and this could have originated everywhere. So it's actually a very difficult task. And in this particular case, it actually came from the site. But it, like, there's lots of these one-liners for, uh, uh, for all of the new sites. So how good are we actually doing? So, I used a, a linear classifier, stochastic gradient classifier, um, from scikit-learn, obviously. Uh, again, as I said, doc to vec embeddings as inputs, and outputs should be the class labels, Zeit, Spon, Focus. Um, and I didn't use my entire training, uh, my entire data set. I used stratified training and test sets so uh, that I had the equal amount of uh, test and uh, training data for, for all classes, for all of the three classes. So about 35,000 comments for training and 15,000 comments for uh, testing. So how good are we actually doing? Fairly OK. So the training accuracy is around 60%. Uh, and the test accuracy, so with novel data, it's, a, it's roughly 50%, which is OK. I mean, random guessing would be uh, like one third, 33%. Uh, we can also look at more detail, like what's the confusion matrix here? Uh, so in the training data, this looks very nice. Uh, in the test data, it's a bit more messy because it classifies like site as sort of a default, but still there's some, some pattern in there. Still, we're doing like 50%. And as I told you, it's actually a hard task, right? OK. So uh, now coming finally back to the hypothesis we formulated in the beginning. Um, in order to look uh, for evidence for this hypothesis, what we can do is actually ask now the machine learning classifier, what do you think is the most prototypical comment that represents best a particular class? So uh, like, what is the typical focus comment? What is the typical uh, spawn comment? What, is, what have you learned there? So, and, and we do a little uh, guessing game here. So this is the best representing one for one particular class. And, and you've got to guess which class that is. So uh, I'm just going to read the, the English part, which uh, I tried to translate it, but it was really difficult. Um, so nor is it just too tight for living things beyond man, but ultimately even for ourselves, because it is less anthropocentric, as it implies a very, idea of life, a very narrow idea of life. So this sort of like pseudo-intellectual uh, poetry <laughs> originated, any guesses? Yeah, that, that was OK. So this is the best, so this is the, the typical user comment under a site news article. What, so th that's what the machine learning classifier thinks. That's like pure site. OK, so next, moving on, moving on, next one. So uh, the manufacturer doesn't get the money saved on an old toaster. Therefore, the breaking point is placed where even the expert needs a flex saw. So this is a more sensical uh, comment actually saying that uh, things break on purpose so you can sell more stuff. Um, like phones or here a toaster. Any, any guesses? So that's the best representing for which class? No, it's actually, it's, it's Spiegel Online. OK. So th this is going to be easy now. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this is the best representing, and it reads, 
These misogynist Muslims understand only a hard hand and have to be deported immediately. If they reside as refugees here, this is what Mrs. Merkel got us with her open borders policy. Okay, yes. It's, and I mean, that you, can, uh, you can go it's like the top 20, top 30, and they all look like that. Trust me. But this is like enough of that. So, um, uh, so, but uh, this is basically my talk. Let me do like a short recap uh, what we did. Uh, so I started with um, uh, scraping comments from HTML source code uh, from these three different news outlets. Uh, we used then these data to uh, train a Dr. Vec network on these uh, user comments that I scraped, and we uncovered some interesting semantic relations such as this one. Uh, and also, then we use the Dr. Vec uh, embeddings as an input to a machine learning classifier with some reasonable performance, so it could reasonably well classify where it originated from. And actually, if we look at the prototypical examples, uh, no, no doubt that this actually holds holds here at this point. So that's that's that. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk. It was really great. Um, when you showed the training for Dr. Vec, uh, it seemed like the documents and the word vectors live in the same embedding space. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Does it have any meaning? No, actually, they're not. They're not. You need some concatenation or uh, addition operation. But the, they have two different weight matrices. Got it. OK, thanks. That was great. Um, how come you didn't do more pro, uh, pre processing? So, removing stop words or stemming, limitization? Uh, yeah, that's probably some, some good idea to do because that would reduce the uh, uh, like basic vocabulary by a lot. But on the other hand, this is user comments. So, like typos are an intricate thing of that. So, if you would stem away of that stuff, you probably lose some uh, signal in terms of like people doing like errors a lot. Like there's like shitloads of errors in the user in the user comments. So, but yeah, I could. Uh, it, it's probably nice to try that too. Nice presentation, thank you. Uh, so I was, I was having the question about uh, what kind of function did you use for this who is who topic? Like, uh, how did you how did you find? Which is the best comment in that particular I, document? I just I just uh, used all the training documents, put them into the classifier, and the one that was like the highest rated for that class that was the prototypical comment. So the one that is where the machine learning classifier is most certain that this is part of that class. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, regarding the pre-processing and the errors, um, have you any idea how you could encode punctuation? Because that might be really revealing for like sight or focus. Yes. Uh, yeah, I thought so too. They, uh, because they do use a lot of exclamation marks. That's <laughs> that's true. Uh, no idea. I, I mean, the thing is, if you leave them in there, uh, your uh, like the vocabulary explodes, right? Because it's it's difficult, so I have I can't give you an answer here. But if if you have an idea, please let me know. Yeah, well, you may just f hand engineer features like counting the number of commas per word or so. Uh, actually, not no. So I ha don't have any tests with baselines. Or so so probably this classification task can with standard methods pretty much be improved. Like if you do TF-IDF plus a linear classifier or non-linear classifier, you probably would get better results. Uh, I was I was just. Uh, curious of how do, uh, Dr. Vec works and if we can actually uh, also use the output of that as an input to a machine learning classifier. Yeah. But there's probably tons of methods that would outperform that by a large margin. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, 
Thank you very much for the talk. I just wanted to ask you uh, about Doc2Vec. So in this process of extra converting the documents to vectors, you have all your documents that you will do both training and testing on. And I was just wondering if there is a way if, for example, now you have a new comment, could you convert this comment somehow to, to the vectors because it, it didn't yes. take part? Okay. Yes, you can. And actually, that's a very good question. Uh, because I didn't use, so the, the test set that I used in the end for the performance measurement, um, they weren't part actually of the training set for the Dr. Vec. So I try to separate these till the very end. So what you actually do is um, you chuck in um, it's like the, 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 the whole context, different context in that document, and, uh, and you know the outputs. And basically what you do is a gradient descent um, on the weight matrix for this new document, and then you find uh, basically the closest representation due to this uh, uh, gradient descent, like eight or 10 steps. Uh, so yes, you can do use very novel data and just compute uh, document embeddings for that too. That's actually, what, again, as what I did for the test set. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, comments usually are in the context of the articles. Do you have also information about the articles themselves, like uh, the headline or the text? And uh, could you I play around with these connections? Uh, I haven't looked at it. So it's actually, I have the data. So I also, I think I scraped the title uh, and like the short description of the article is for. Uh, but I haven't looked at that, no. And I mean, like some assumptions are here violated because there's, of course, a correlation between uh, between comments made on the same article, because they, at least, they try to respond sometimes to each other. But uh, yeah, so but I haven't looked at that. Yes. Yeah, maybe it would be fun to generate the most, the the focus is respondent the site comment most probable for some article or something like that. Yeah. So I try to uh, randomly select articles, so not to get a bias by the top. But I mean, like the topics covered by these mag by these news outlets are slightly different. So. Some of the uh, results might, might stem from that, yes. But I mean, during training and testing, I, I tried to make sure that all the comments in the test set uh, were, like, were from articles uh, or that haven't been used in a training set. So I, I didn't try to mix these. But yeah, still, there might be some signal in there. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, are you planning on uh, offering um, a web API for this awesome tool that you can, uh, that you can, uh, use, uh, that you can use for recommending users that might have landed on the wrong news site? <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, no, because I contacted Site and Spiegel about it, but they never responded. So I'm, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, publish that without their permission. So maybe I can ask them again. But the emails I sent them just entered the void. So uh, maybe they didn't like the idea at all. Because, I mean, they don't, they don't look so good in the comment section. Um, have you have you compared your uh, uh, results here with a, a baseline? Uh, no, I haven't. A simple one. So, as I said, probably TF-IDF plus classifier would outperform that uh, a lot. So it's more like experimenting. So uh, that was not like scientific. Rig I mean, the hypothesis formulated is like not a very sciencey one in the first place, right? So, <laughs> But yeah, it would, so actually what we did um, in a hacker day at Flixbus, we tried to use this exact se setup for classifying emails. So uh, when people complain like the Wi-Fi didn't work or I lost something on the bus, uh, that needs to be classified uh, and sent to the uh, correct guys to actually handle that. Um, so we tried this, and it sucked a lot in comparison to TF-IDF plus uh, support vector machine. So. OK, are there any other questions? If not, let's thank Robert again for his wonderful.